convince me to about that. Uh, I'm Sean, uh, I'm the recruit manager for Leeds at BGSS. Um, I've done this talk before, I somehow dragged it out to about an hour. Um, I've been told not to do that much time. So um, I'll try and condense it. So if I do fly through anything or skim over bits, then you know, always have to chat afterwards and go through anything. Um, so I thought I'd start with some stats. I don't know these off by heart, uh, so I'll kind of let you read them uh, as well. Um, but innovations have been developed at lightning speeds to drive faster growth and efficiency for businesses uh, and society. There's a lack of digital skills. Um, according to Accenture, um, the digital skills gap could cost the UK 141 billion um, in growth and revenue. And I, I like gifts, so you get you get the joys of gifts and Macaulay Culkin. So, uh, according to more stats, uh, by the Open University, the majority of SMEs um, are struggling to find workers with the right skills. I'm sure we can all kind of relate to that. And just if you're not a tech recruiter, I'm very tech driven on this, but there are bits that do relate to other things. Um, and they think that the skills gap is, is getting worse. Uh, so that leads to inflated salaries, temporary workers. I'm sure we've all seen people with three years experience going contracting for 500 pound a day. Uh, and overstretched workforces, which as internal recruiters, we can all relate to, because we're often the first hit by that sort of thing. Um, Obviously that, that has uh, knock-on effects, poor morale, low productivity, uh, exhaustion. Um, so what can we do about this? And I, I use the collective we quite, quite strongly because I'm a, a big believer in a community um, approach to being able to tackle these problems. I think if we, and we'll get into this, I think if we silo things on an individual basis too much, we actually kind of miss out on quite a lot because there's a lot we could do together. So. Um, it's an opportunity, so the so-called digital skills gap is an opportunity for us. Um, to address it as organisations and as driving forces um, you know, to, to the leadership teams you know, in our organisations, we've, we've got to invest and, and try and challenge and, and promote that uh, in enabling our workforces to, to reskill. And there's no time like the present, right? Um, what is required is a holistic solution um, and prioritises new approaches to skills development within an existing workforce and also previously untapped talent pools. So um, we'll sort of get onto that, but especially from a tech standpoint, it's like, oh, I need a, a mid level or a senior this and that. Everybody does, right? I can guarantee you now every software engineer that I offer, I'm going to pick on Clive because it's in the room. Clive is also offered, and so have two other companies. So actually, there's, there's different ways we can still go for that talent but we can, we can get more talent as well. So a lot of what I see happen, um, I've just used random companies, you've all heard of company A, B and C, uh, is company A um, you know, loses somebody to company B, who then loses someone to company C, who then loses someone to company A. We're all sat there giving ourselves a right pat on the back because we've got this awesome person that's just joined us. And then we kind of sit there and go three months later, oh shit, my headcount is still the same. I've not actually moved anything a lot. Um, we're always going to see that, and that's, a, that, that's fine. That's not a bad thing, but we need to look beyond our doorstep. Um, so one thing we want to do is we want to retain that talent in the north, right? Because companies A, B and C are awesome companies. So I'd rather that I lost someone from company A to company B, if it means that, that we retain that talent in the north. Um, but we need to add that further talent as well. So we'll sort of go through like ways that, that we can actually look to tackle that uh, and approach that. So, a <laughs> fiction fans here. Right, so a few things that we'll run through. Uh, sponsorship, um, we'll, we'll touch on that. The European talent pool. Now, I've sort of done this talk while Brexit has been like pending for about three years or whatever it is now. Um, I've not really had to change it. I think I've got legs in this in what, a couple of months till I need to probably change this. Um, but we've still got it for now, so let's leverage that. Uh, relocators, uh, we'll run through that one. Uh, grads and apprentices, uh, returners to work. Everyone sees a lot of stuff around that now, right? I've taken career gaps for X, Y, and Z reasons. Uh, cross training, uh, in my organization, we talk about T-shaped employees a lot. Um, you know, T-shapes, it's, it's, the more you say it, the more you hate it, but you know, it's something to consider. Uh, upskilling, looking at that emerging talent, um, and career changes uh, as well. 
I need to remember where all the good gifts are because I think some are right at the end and I don't want to lose it. Um, so I pulled out, these are a little bit out of date, I'm still waiting for the 2019 sort of reports to come through, they're normally end of Jan, beginning of Feb, so I apologise, but it paints, um, paints a relative picture. Um, so looking at the graph, we're looking at uh, destinations to non-European tech talent. UK is like a, a leader um, in, in terms of sponsoring and, and getting that talent from outside of the, the EU. Germany, you know, that's got a massive boom going on, right? There's loads of cool stuff going on in well, mainly Berlin, because I, I love Berlin, so I keep an eye on it. Um, but if you want to sponsor, you need to, to have an A-rated license. So if you're an organisation that doesn't, just go get a drink for two minutes, eat some pizza, because I'm going to bore you. Um, so it gives you the ability to employ someone from outside the, the European Economic Area, uh, provides a route for that, that candidate uh, to settlement within the UK. So I'm sure if you're someone who doesn't sponsor, you speak to someone who like, got indefinite leave to remain, you're golden, you know, or shit, you don't, I can't really talk to you anymore because I can't sponsor you. Um, and yeah, it's a graph, graph shows with that, that top destination. Or oh, we were for 2017 and 18. I guess the, the slides will be quite interesting when I actually update it. Um, so yeah, foreign tech works are vital to, to countries like Germany and Britain. And then we touch on to the European market. Um, so looking at destinations for intra-Europe tech uh, talent immigration. The UK again, um, and Germany again, uh, levelling up in, in 2018. The, the leading uh, forces be behind that as well. Um, so one thing, I, I always like to talk about the European market, and it, it links back to that slide I did with the company ABC thing, and I'm looking further afield, and this all ties in. Is, um, I used to work at Sky when Sky decided and, uh, to become a different entity when the, the Sky Sky uh, Bet split happened. Um, so we were hiring, I think, 400 people in, in two years or something ridiculous, all, all tech teams. Um, naturally, the, the first 12 months are great, right? Because you're a new brand in a city, you put an advert out, Everyone applies to you who, who wants to. You hire half of them, reject the other half. Oh, you know, Chris has joined. Who do you know, Chris? Three more referrals in, right? My first year of that role was nothing more than administration and a few phone calls. It was, it was pretty easy. The second year got a bit more difficult because we kind of realised we either hired everyone or rejected everyone. So we, we realised, oh shit, the Leeds market, there's not that much going for us at the moment. You still get bits, but not the numbers we needed. Um, so we actually broke up as a team and started looking at all the European markets, we mapped out, right, okay, what countries can we find that, you know, if we need JavaScript or Scala or whatever it was, had a lot of that, what companies um, uh, actually use that, that technology, right, we'll target those. So we probably brought in um, about 30 to 40 people um, from Europe, um, which was great. So everyone hated us at the, at the beginning if we took like 10 people from their company in that first year, but actually now you look at half those people we brought from Europe and are working in different companies within Leeds, so they're benefiting from it, if that makes sense. Um, <clears throat> so actually it's, it's quite a good way to sort of start topping up that talent pool from, from untapped talent that no one else is looking at, right? Um, Germany, the only country in Europe that's home to more software developers than Britain, uh, according to Atomica. Um, never heard of them until I did this like a year ago. Um, but it, it's just interesting, you know, look at Germany, loads of software engineers, are there any that we can start to, to tap up, work out where the good companies are, and, and start to try and attract that talent in, right? You always look at, and we'll come on to it in a bit, London. If you wanted a career and you wanted to progress and you wanted to work at the best companies, you went to London. You don't need to, do you? You can come to, come to Leeds, come to Manchester, Sheffield, you know, Newcastle, Hull, wherever it is, we've, we've got awesome shit going on. Um, and yeah, our, our slightly dissipated, um, so yeah, we, we became tied. Uh, when, it, when it comes to tech worker immigration, but it shows that the, out of you know, the, the, the two nations, we're kind of thinking a bit further afield than a lot of the, the other nations were when it comes to that. So relocators, it leads nicely on. So how do we relocate uh, people to the north? Northern powerhouse. How often has this been banged on and drilled into our heads in the last couple of years, right, about the Northern Powerhouse? Uh, last time I did this talk, I managed to offend the council at the same time. So before I continue, is anyone from the council? No? Excellent. <laughs> no healthy debate going to happen with flow. Um, but, you know, there's, there's loads of cool shit going on here, and there's, there's so much that we can promote. So if I can, if I can sell that to a candidate, right, my organisation might not be the right organisation for that candidate. 
but I can put them in touch with 20 people that are different, different types of companies that, that might be that right fit. So, you know, we can, we can really sell that Northern Powerhouse tech scene. We need to stop thinking about that, that silo, what my organisation can offer, and go, actually, you know, if you were looking at Leeds or Manchester or wherever, this is, this is what you can get out of a career. If you moved up north, you don't have to worry about where's my next step if it's not within your organisation, because there's loads of awesome organisations I can go and get that from. So we need to sell that more rather than going, oh, BGSS is great, you get to work with loads of different clients. That's true, don't want to work in consultancy, I'm fucked, right? Yeah, it's not for me, but I can put you in touch with, what do you want to work in? Retail, betting and gaming, media, healthcare. Oh, these are the areas that interest me. Right, I'll put you in touch with three people who can talk to you about that, right? And, and help you out. So we need to be a bit more collaborative when it comes to that sort of stuff. Um, cheaper cost of living. Uh, I mean, I, I'm, as you can probably tell from the accent, I went all the way from North Yorkshire to West Yorkshire, so I'm, I'm got really short arms and deep pockets. Um, I don't want to pay £8 for a pint, uh, I'm, I'm just saying. So, you know, if you talk to anyone who likes a beer, sold. Or, you know, you can get a one bed flat where you, your bedroom's in your kitchen and your bathroom, <laughs> where you can get a five, five bed house with like an acre of land, you know, sell that. It'd work on me anyway, but I'm already tight. So, uh, and organisations of all sizes and sectors. So that's the other thing. We've got everything here from every industry you can think of, from startups to, to global giants. That's that's a big selling point, um, I think, to, to candidates, and, and that's something we should be selling as well. It's like, yeah, you might join us and you might stay forever, or you know, you might join because you know there's so many different opportunities for, for you to have a career here and to move around. So we should promote that a bit more. Um, I've spoken to a few people about actually we could probably do stuff together and actually sell our brands um, at a sort of one. I'm, I'm trying to attract people that way. Um, and leverage the market together and that's it. It's the collaboration thing again. We need to stop thinking that the company we work in and what we do is a be all and end all. Right, okay, we've got targets, we've got people to hire. I get that, you know, that's, no, that's basically my life. But um, the, the more we, I think we collaborate and we sell things as a, as a unit for the North, I think the more talent we can actually start to pull in. And who doesn't love Tina Fey? Come on, I mean, she's <laughs> awesome. Um, grads and apprentices, so we need to inspire the future generations. Uh, you can probably tell just by me being up here. I, yeah, I dropped out of college in the first year, so uh, <laughs> a lot of this isn't relevant to me. Um, but one thing I never had is from a young age that, that, that tech opportunities were, were a career you could get into, whatever career path you take. So we need to start inspiring those younger generations and start, you know, you can do a lot of the, the community stuff within your organisation, even if you just go and solo it and build those relationships. Let's inspire that future generation that has a career here because if you're choosing what you want to do at uni, <clears throat> if you want to go into the tech market, you're probably going to do a computer science degree or, or something relevant. Um, a lot of people might not think about it, so we can kind of start to, start to inspire people. So let's start with school kids, right? The, they're also, I mean, when, I, when I've met school kids, most of them want to be footballers and more money than Messi. And, you know, I've said, look, if it's all right, your mum will keep in touch, just in case that happens and I can retire early. Um, but, you know, that's, that's the sort of thing we can do. So a lot of social media stuff, uh, the hackathons, go in and do, like, really fun, like, Raspberry Pi or little challenges with them. Um, and just talk to them and just try and get that engagement from a young age. Uh, the apprenticeship levy, um, one of Chris's team, uh, Ash, actually did a... Uh, brilliant talk on, on how they've leveraged this. You know, if you are an organisation of a size where you know a load of your profits going to go into, into into this, use it. Don't shy away from it. I met with a chap from um, I want to say IBM, but I don't want to get it wrong now. It's recorded. Um, I think it was, um, but he he was great. So they they had so much excess that they couldn't use. They were actually starting to go out to the Leeds market to companies to go. Do you want this? We'll, we'll give you that pot and fund it for you because we don't want to lose this money to London and you know get it spent on palms or something. Um, when we can start getting more talent through that way. So again, it's seeing that collaboration stuff come through. But if you do have the apprenticeship levy, look into it. There's loads of cool different companies that will, will support you and be able to leverage that. Um, or just start out with a couple if you're not sure it's your first time. Just test the water a bit, build your process, refine it, innovate, look back do it again, bring four in, you know, and start to build on that. Uh, and then obviously unis, you know, I never got that far, I just kept in touch with friends who went there for the, the cheap nights. But uh, <laughs> engaging universities, um, 
that's a big thing, right? We can get a lot of leverage out of that. If you speak to Jeff Suter at Leeds Trinity, um, they want to start doing STEM courses. So they actually engaged local businesses uh, like Sky, Bet Sky, BGSS, and loads of others um, to actually go, well, what's relevant to you? We know that it's a, an industry that's constantly changing. So we don't want to build a course that we're then legally bound to for three years, four years, however long you go to uni. Um, and, and be giving you a candidate at the end of it, that's just not relevant because they've got 30% of the skills you want. So actually the more we engage as, as organisations, they'll, they'll be able to tailor and tweak stuff every time they're bringing in uh, different intakes to make sure that we're getting the right students for us as well so we can get the most out of it. Oh, I didn't even have a gift, good. Right, <laughs> return to work programmes. Um, how many people here have done sort of return to work programmes? I'm not saying where I have now, but you know, anyone? No? So, Shell, pick on the big guys, right? Anyone here from Shell? I mean, it's good before I do anything. Um, you know, they, they've done some great work around this. Um, so, they did it from if you've had a career break of, of 12 plus months, last maternity, paternity, caring for someone, you know what? I just didn't want to work for a year because I could afford it. I could just do what, watch Jeremy Cowell or go travelling, whatever it is. You know, they've got those, a lot of big companies now, and you've seen smaller ones start to do it, start to build in programs to attract this talent. Because um, it's an untapped talent pool, right? You can leverage people that have some great skills that no one else is thinking of. Um, but the way we're thinking, when you look back at company A, B, C, we'll wait three years till they've come back, and then we'll be like, oh, they're great, yeah, I want them. But why am I thinking of them up front? Uh, Amazon, um, they did a two years plus one. So they really went for it because, you know, why not? It's Amazon. I love Amazon. That's going to divide opinion, right? But uh, I do love Amazon. Uh, I'm opening up uh, a new talent pool. So it's opening up a new talent pool of candidates, right? Um, making sure it's appealing to everybody as well. There's a lot of focus on women in tech stuff, which I think is fantastic and it's great. There's actually a lot that starts to get lost from that and, and we start to get so siloed in, in the approach we're thinking of. We just need to make sure we think of everybody. If female, male, non-binary, however you identify, we've got to make sure that anything like this we're doing is, is appealing to, to the broadest demographic we possibly can. Um, I think everything companies are doing is great, but there's so much more we can sort of do on top of that as well. Cross-training, we're flying through this. Not for busy, no time. <laughs> um, boot camps. So this is where it gets a bit software engineering. So if you're not a tech recruiter, I apologize. Um, but it's been my life for 11 years, so I'm going to make you suffer it for two more minutes. Um, looking at cross-training software engineers from, from uh, different language backgrounds. So actually, you know what, we've got a team that's you know, Java, um, but I've got a really great candidate who's done that, you know, completely different, but they want to, like, they're open to learning new things and they've got a lot of good core engineering skills behind that. Can we look at doing like mini boot camps to train them up? So we did a similar thing at Sky, it backfired in the end actually, a little bit. Uh, one of the first teams that we transitioned from, from London um, was Ruby. I quickly learned that in the north there's not loads of places that do Ruby, not when you need like 40 people. Um, so we hammered that the usual on the beach there, Ruby, right, we'll pull out a few where we can. Um, we actually did a small, small company where we took out about two, but they had to change the tech stack after that because they were the two best devs, so we felt a bit guilty about that one. Um, you know, and, and we realised it wasn't really anywhere you had to keep going and broad for it. So what we did instead was go, we just want good software engineers. So we started offering the opportunity to go, we don't care what language you, you're coming from, but if you want to work in Ruby, you know, we'll put you through a four week boot camp and then you'll be on project delivery. Um, and that actually opened up loads. What, what we found was actually a lot of JavaScript developers did it, um, which was really annoying because in hindsight, if we planned ahead for like the third team after that one coming, was about 50 JavaScript people, so it kind of backfired at the time. But, um, you know, at the time it worked really well and it actually attracted more people to come in. If we were just going for Ruby, I think after we did that, I was pulling in like one mid to senior level engineer who was Ruby from abroad every month because there was just no one I could pull from a local area, so I was just going really far to get um, So think a bit, a bit smart like that and go, actually, it's a little bit of a cost and an offset at the beginning. Of, of that four weeks, but the benefits I'll get from it and actually being able to deliver what we need to deliver by doing that kind of outweighs it, right? So it comes on to the T-shaped employees. You know, we don't have to specialise. Um, you know, you've got people that, that can start to pick up other skills. 
do it. it you know, it doesn't matter what, what sort of role it is. You know, you get uh, the way we look at it. We'll have a BA who could be a product owner somewhere because they've got those skills, or a delivery manager that'll be a scrum master because they, they know all that. That's that's a good thing, right? Because you can start to leverage people's skills a bit more. Uh, but also, you start giving those those individuals within your company a bit more diversity of what their role could look like as well and what they can actually do. Um, so just stop you need to stop pigeonholing people in. Um, in terms of duty, um, sort of internal mobility to, to move into new roles. So, hands up how many people do secondments? Oh, not as many as I thought. You know, secondments is a great way to do it. You know, if you need someone for six months, why go to the contract market or try and find someone on a fixed term who's going to be half decent? Because <coughs> if you're lucky, you'll get someone really good. Um, is there anyone internally that you could sort of give that opportunity to? Uh, and it might be where they want to take their careers. You might actually keep them longer term. Um, because if they want to go that route and you don't give them that opportunity, they'll go somewhere else and get it right. Um, so, so look at uh, tours of duty. That's a good way. Oh, I forgot to put this on earlier. Best gift ever, right? <laughs> Who doesn't love Ralph? <laughs> Got tired on my leg and everything. <laughs> right, upskilling. Uh, step into tech schemes. Um, so opening the pathway. I picked on engineers again. Sorry, that's what I know. Uh, but open up the pathway to engineers of the future, right? So. I'm picking on places I've worked because um, I've seen it, seen it work in action. But uh, Sky did a great one um, where they started to give people that, that step into tech. Uh, BBC did the, the same thing. Um, both of those, to be fair, were focused on trying to get more women into into that part of the industry. Um, but you know, it doesn't have to be. You could open that up quite quite broad, right? Um, and you could do it across different types of roles as well. It doesn't have picked some engineers. So that's where my examples are. But you could do that with with anything. Especially with tech uh, and career changes. So we don't work in a world of jobs for life anymore. So it used to be, you know, starting this company. If you're a lot to me, you'll get the promotions, and you know, you find yourself up here 60 years later, right? Um, they keep putting the retirement age up. I'm not, you know, struggling to keep up with that. I'll, you know, probably gone before before I reach it. But um, we don't have that anymore. A lot of people have multiple careers. You know, you might do 20 years in this and then actually go, don't like that anymore. Finance is boring. I want to be a software engineer or something. That's cool. We should we should promote that and, and, and look at that. Um, and we'll realise it when we all do it, because let's be honest, like recruitment. It's, I like it, but, you know, I'm, all right, I'm only 21 and I'm looking at me now. <laughs> um, so people will hold multiple careers. Don't, don't shy away from that. It's, it's a positive thing. We need to stop stop looking at things in a negative way. And again, it's an untapped pool of potential. So like AWS do a restart program. Great way, you know, talk to those guys if you're in tech and, and see if you can do something with those. Um, but it's a really nice way to, to get people that have a load of talent. Uh, the thing I find with career changes is as well, they already come with a lot of the, um, say corporate, but you know, they've already been in that commercial setting. They, they already come with a lot of that. They know that all the different conversations that, that you have with people. It's not like a grad where You've got some really good foundations from a learning perspective, but you're going to learn a lot professionally and personally in your first few years as you interact with different people within a business. Um, it kind of flips it the other way a bit with career changes. You kind of come with a lot of that side, and you're like, you're just great with people, and you kind of get it in the relationships, but we just need to get you there on the skills level, right? Um, so we should, should invest in that as well. I'm not saying I'd do all of these, by the way. I mean, I'd love to do all of these, but it's uh, just stuff to think about. Um, so, different ways. Again, software engineer point. Um, you've got places like CodeClan in Scotland, Mix Academy in London, North Code in Code Nation in North, that, that do all this kind of stuff. And we'll get people from, uh, well, we've just used North Code for the first time, actually, and brought in our first two devs back in the last year. Um, and what was great when we went to speak to them, you've got people that, you know, someone who's a solicitor, like, way too clever for me. Um, you've got people, and then you've got the extreme of people who are refugees. That, that are going through these, you start to get a lot of diversity as well um, from, from the people that, that you're bringing in. Um, so they're great for it from an engineering thing. Uh, X Forces, FDM do this really well at the place you're uh, going to, to the guy who heads all up, uh, do a talk on it, and sort of give advice on how you should like treat that as well, because um, it's totally different altogether. Uh, but there's a lot of X Forces that come back, serve for our country, and then get left in a bit of limbo. So you can start to put programs together to actually, you know, I'm not saying big numbers, but again, if you start doing a few people, uh, it's more talent uh, that you can bring in. Uh, I always found with X-Forces as well, they're very punctual. Um, 
I imagine you have to be. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, they're, they're, they're on it. They're great. Um, the return to work stuff we, we just talked about. Uh, and one that always sparks up a little bit of a divide is, is ex-offenders. Um, there's some great talks out by other recruiters. Um, Theo Smith does one around neurodiversity and it's fantastic. Um, and I can't remember the stats, so I'm not going to quote it. But he actually looked at the, the stats of, ex, uh, of offenders that are, are neurodiverse and then the struggle that they get to get back into employment. Um, I'm not saying it's going to work for, for every role or everything, but again, it's something that we should always be thinking about and considering and, and researching. Speak to people who have done something. Um, again, it's, it's you know, a positive program right? um, that, that we should look at. So what else can we do? I'm off of time. I have no idea. I'm just rattling yeah, through. Yeah, golden. <laughs> Um, right, I've got to thank Clive for this one because when I first did this presentation, I sent it to Clive to, to sense check a bit. Uh, and he made a great point that poor tables, ping pong, playstations, and fake grass alone don't make a great place to work. We get fooled by LinkedIn a lot, don't we, and Twitter because I look at it and go, that would be great. Um, apparently, we have a pool table, I've never found it, and we've only got four floors, it says a lot for that. Bird Jack also, getting there. Um, but what, what do candidates really want to look at? and, and what is going to help us attract and, and appeal um, to people. Work-life balance, you know, we always need to address that and look at what we can do. Every company is different, I get that. I'm a consultancy, I'm more restricted because we're sort of held by the client in terms of what they want us to do. Um, but, you know, we'd be as flexible as we possibly can and I know there's some other companies that, that are fantastic at it. At BBC, I work two days at home a week. If there's a little bit of snow or it's cold, I'd be like, oh, train's not really, mate. Work from home, fine. Didn't really matter. Um, <clears throat> state it. You know, if you've got really good flexible working arrangements, advertise that. You know, there's a lot of like, adverts are boring anyway, right? If you've got some good stuff to shout about, shout about it. Um, the flexible working really plugs the gap uh, from a digital skills thing. Because a lot of people look at it and go, "I've got to be full time. I've got to be nine till five. It's five days a week." If you're not that kind of company, sell that because you're tapping into that talent pool that no one else is tapping into. Advertise part-time roles. Um, from a tech stand, I know every role is different, but from a tech standpoint, if you were hiring software engineers, hands up how many people would advertise like three days plus a week? We've only just started doing that. Oh, you would, wouldn't you? <laughs> Come in your talk, mate. Uh, but we, we did it at BBC, so we went, actually, shall we just try an advert where it's three days plus a week? Because we needed like 50 engineers. So we thought we could start splitting that up a little bit, right? Got finance to go, do you know what, if we get to and it's six days, I'll sign it off. It's fine. What we found was a lot of people thought it would appeal to parents, so mums and dads that have you know, taken time off, want to see their kids, which is, which is a nice thing to do, right? Cause, you know, my best mate's had a baby and she's like walking now and she was, wasn't doing that when I saw her like three months ago. <laughs> um, but you should advertise it. We found that we actually tapped into a broader demographic than that. My favorite one, we had one chat, he did, um, is it bouldering, where you drop down like caves and stuff? Is that what it, yeah, anyone, yeah. cave, caver? Oh, bouldering? Yeah, yeah, he did that, right? He wanted a three day week, because he wanted to spend long weekends going to places bouldering, because otherwise it would take so much holiday to just go to like Ireland or France to do it. He couldn't get that. So we were like, no one else is getting this great engineer, but we'll have him, because he'll do an awesome job while he's here. Um, and it, it, seriously, there was less of the whole parents thing, and. and you know, and, and carers that we thought would be like 80% of traffic. It kind of flipped it the other way, and it's just people who don't want to work full time for various reasons. I mean, if I could, have, you know, if you look at people's different lifestyles, that's a great way to get more talent in. And, and seriously, if you don't do it, have a think about it, and maybe trial it in an area where they're sort of bought in and look at it. But it landed really well for us, and that was even with like tech lead senior people. It, it, it worked really well. Works quite well with um, students as well. So I. I went part time as a student okay. and I worked at a top full time job in my company said, Hey, you know, we really want to keep you, you've been great on your placement, um, work your uni hours around us and do it that way. And you stayed, right? So I stayed, um, where did you work? It, it was down south, um, but I worked for a global tech company. So, you know, if I wasn't at uni I was fine all over the world. Um, but you know, for example like my output and everything was greater than people but I was committed it actually I made it work for me and the company made it work yes yeah, so if you're a bit flexible actually there's a great bit of talent I mean how many students would love to you know have a, a 
flexible employer where they could earn some good money yeah. and also go to uni. I find the more flexible you are with people, you yeah. get more back, right? If someone yeah. goes to me, if you need to leave at three, it's fine. Yeah. I'll leave at three, but I'll probably put in about an extra 10 hours yeah. a week because I feel guilty because yeah. that's how it's always been instilled in us before. Yeah. Um, and you tend to get more from people because yeah. they really appreciate that flexibility yeah. and they'll give it back. Okay, yeah. um, so it's a really good way to do it. Uh, remote working, uh, two plus points for this. One, you know, office overheads, always good. Um, but we're seeing a lot more of people that want remote working. Um, it's not for everyone or it doesn't work for every company. Um, but if it is something that can work for you, sell it. There's a lot of people that are just looking for remote work. Um, so you can start to tap into to that talent that no one else is as well. Um, and your interview process, you know, I think it's all probably tied to, to Chris's at some point, but, um, you know, we, we put in like really long-winded or broken old school interview processes and actually we, we need to look at a lot more, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's a big place where it's like competency or whatever, or we're looking for X, Y, and Z and there's no flex. Well, actually we should be looking at attitude a lot of it as well. So where, where people do have gaps and we, you've got an environment that you can support that and train that, you know, make your interview process fit that because if you're sort of failing to do that, you're getting rid of that other good talent as well. Um, and then you're just going back around in that circle from, from one of the first slides. So there's a lot we can do that ties into that as well. Um, and mental health and wellbeing programs, it's like the hot topic at the moment, isn't it, with, with everybody. Um, we're actually running a, a feel good fortnight for the, the last two weeks of January because it's you know, the start that like, it's the, the most depressing, uh, I think one of the last uh, days in January is one of the most depressing days in the year for people because it's always that long slog after Christmas and everyone's broke um, and we get, get a bit down. So we're actually running a lot of feel good fortnight stuff to, uh, for two weeks, loads of different events and um, activities and different things to try and keep people's mental health uh, at the top. And, and that's another thing that. that yeah, it should be offered everywhere as well because you know, people do, do struggle. We should be supportive of that and make sure we can retain that talent and also look after people, right? And as recruiters, it's, you know, we have our days, don't we? So always got to think. And be employee friendly. Um, so it comes to that, like, always appeal to, to the broader demographic um, and tap into to that, that, that broader uh, talent pool there as well. So DNI. There you go, attracts a broad, it's like I've done this before, uh, attracts a broad demographic of candidates, uh, and that's everything, I'm not just talking about gender, religion, race, all that, that's, that's everything, the way people think, the, the whole shit um, we, we need to make sure that we're, I think I said it to uh, somebody at work is, you know, we're quite, quite white male heavy, because we're in the tech industry and that's what a lot is, I think if we're always attracting a, the, the broadest demographic possible, um, and especially from a young age, we'll start to see that gap go, go, go uh, over time. I, don't know, I thought Muppets would work, but it doesn't look great that side, does it? It's the best one I could get. Um, so we need to unlock potential uh, for women in non binary. Um, so transparency and future opportunities. So, how many times do you lose people because there's an opportunity that just went to Dave, who you've went to uni with Steve, and used to go to the pub and play five side football you know, once a week? Um, we need to ensure that in our organisations we're as transparent on, on every opportunity there is there so everybody's got that, that level playing field to go for things. Uh, which is a level skill building playing field. So, and that's for everybody, women, men, non-binary, non everybody. There shouldn't be a, a, a preference. So when I was at Sky there was one thing that frustrated me a little bit with leadership roles. That if we got one you had to present a 50-50 shortlist so then you start to positively discriminate. And if you didn't do that, then you had to write a comment why you didn't do it and what you did to try and attract the talent and all that stuff. So most of mine was just always writing notes <laughs> uh, every time. So I don't get giving anyone a preference. It should just be level for everybody and everyone should be given the same opportunity. Uh, so we need to, need to make sure everyone's got the same opportunity to progress with those skills and, and we don't single anyone out. Um, and that's fostering a dynamic career path for all. So some people want to progress, some don't. But Whatever role that person is in, you should always always make sure it's fair across the board. Uh, great pathways to STEM fields of education. So it talks about um, uh, Lee Street uh, Uni. Um, actually talking with all the organisations, want to do their, their STEM subjects and make sure they can appeal to everybody and get the content right. Um, you know, should should all play a part in that. Uh, and fix the leadership gap. Um, I don't have any reports on this, but there's always loads of reports, isn't there? In, 
different sectors and companies about where the balances are and, and where they are. Um, but again, I think that literally comes from the, uh, the, the first three bullet points uh, in there for me. Uh, and ensure our processes cater for all. Um, and that goes back to, you know, when you look at like interviewing, um, you know, don't assume that someone's going to speak up if they're going to need any, any help with anything. Uh, try and make sure that you've got the right settings, the right environment, supportive culture, interviewers uh, actually uh, trained well in, in what they're doing. So, um, you know, every time somebody comes in, you shouldn't have to be tweaking too much unless, you know, there's a request to tweak stuff, you should always have a nice environment. Um, I think one of those came out when I had an interview request um, for a chap who, who was autistic and he struggled with bright lights and, and loud noises. So we made sure we had an interview room that was like low footfall. Uh, you know, there's light in that, a lot of natural light coming through, so you didn't have the really dark room or the like blinding light room. Uh, and just little things that you should just always be able to accommodate. Them. So, oh, I'm nearly done. Check that out. Five actions to take away. Um, there's not really a shortage of talent. If we look at everything we just went through there, there's loads of people, loads of opportunities. We just need to make sure that we can uh, all play our part in, in providing those opportunities for people. So look to upskill your current employees, invest in them and you'll see the return. Uh, explore avenues outside the traditional methods. Let's move away from the five mile radius Boolean searches and, and you know, actually look a bit, a bit further than that. Let's look at career returner programs and boot camps. So what people do like in that technical exper uh, experience, a whole load of uh, commercial experience. Uh, ensure your organisation and marketing appeals to a broader demographic than it may already do. So one thing I always do is keep looking at what we're doing, the way we're writing adverts, the way we're putting social media content out. We, you know, if you, we have a social media person, liaise with them and see what they're doing about it as well. And make sure we have an impact on that. As, as recruiters, we, we've got a great opportunity, we're frontline, right? So, we're the ones who are in the firing line if the market is not right. So let's work with these people to make sure that we are appealing to the broadest demographic possible. Uh, and when everyone talks about diversity, my view is if you appeal to the broader demographic, keep hiring, you, you diver diversity is natural. You don't have to force things or shoehorn something in because someone in the leadership team wants to start that we hire 20% of this or you know, anything like that. It shouldn't be like that. It should be natural and organic. Uh, Fancy coffee tables, ping pong, I mean they're nice aren't they, but you don't need them. I normally go off site for my coffee because it's nice. Um, demonstrate the challenges uh, that people get to tackle. So whatever role they're coming in, sell that opportunity and actually, what most people look for is, is the chance to actually use their mind to do good things and challenge themselves and, and tackle a problem and solve it. Sell that. You know, no one wants, I say no one, not a lot of people I speak to want to go into a mundane, I can do it with my eyes closed uh, kind of job. They, they want to be challenged. You know. If you've got that environment, you know, sell that, but make sure you can support people as well. So if they are lacking skills, you can you can keep developing that. T-shirts. Uh, start investing in the future. I think that's a big one. You know, this shouldn't be a conversation in 10, 15 years because hopefully all the work we're all doing now, we'll start to see the results from that. And what we will be doing in you know, five years, 10 years, 15 years is talking about all the awesome things we've been doing and how we can keep improving that even further and what results we've seen. Um, and the final thought, so with the talent pool as challenging as it is, can you create a more open-minded hiring strategy? How many CDs do we spike as a don't fit a job description? So I had this problem when I joined where I was, that there's a certain set of ways for certain things, and you, know, you can't change it overnight. What you can do is start having conversations and trying to influence and, and change and bring people on board with you. Um, so I still, uh, my mate Nat, who's head of tech at Sky, uh, she said, you're hiring talented people, not a job description. Your job description is not going to do any work. Do not define people for great jobs, like define jobs for great people. And I think everything we've just talked about there sort of ties into that one quote. Uh, I have no more gifts, so I will leave it on that. But thank you very much. Yeah, 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 sure. yeah, I don't know if people want to. Oh, question. Oh, sorry, I didn't ask questions. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's a shameless plug and question. I work at Leeds Trinity. Okay. But yes, we've got our next employer advisory board on the 15th of February. So if anyone does want to come and talk to us about how to design our degrees, then. Uh, yeah, getting oh, that's nice, yeah. yeah, yeah, lovely. And then the career changes, uh, there's quite a few programs about career changes. 
tend to be sharp passes though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How how good are the sharp passes? It varies. So we we brought our first two North Coders, so that's like a good one I can use an example of. Twelve week boot camp, mm -hmm. uh, but they do like a ridiculous amount of pre course work um, prior to it, so that they're sort of committed, so they never really get any dropouts um, during. But they can actually read sit modules and do like four week blocks. I think, okay. uh, but they can read sit though, so you know if you're not comfortable with that first four weeks, mm -hmm. um, but they're, they're massive in Manchester and they're, they're growing in Leeds and moving office in Leeds. We've had some real success from it. I think we've got. We've taken a couple from North Coders and um, about five or six through coordination. In fact, we, it went so well with coordination that we um, took some of our internal um, workforce that were interested in tech. So we had a, a girl in our customer services department. We took her and we trained her as a, a dev and someone else from the customer services department. Um, and they're very skilled junior devs now. And that retrain, so that's why we here we've got her up to a level where she could operate. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's a lot of support that comes off the back of it, but um, it's the same with the grads, yeah. you know, they, they get really good fundamentals, they're still going to need mm -hmm. support as they grow yeah. professionally within that role. Um, but they get the, the, the like, you know, good engineering practices and good fundamentals from it, so actually, it's, it's easy to work with that. Sometimes you get someone who's done it for 15 20 years, and so set in the way, so. They're even harder because you, you can't actually get them to like work differently because they've always done it like that. Whereas with uh, with those so enthusiastic um, and bought into it that they just constantly want to learn and just be a sponge of people. So if you put them in the right team, they'll just thrive from it. Uh, but there's a few that I used to. So before we used them, I, I was already known to North Coast because I used to wait about 12 months when I was at the BBC because you know public money can't spend agency fees. Um, and I'd tap them up when they'd be placed somewhere else. I used to wait 12 months, and once I hired like two, I knew mean, they were really good. Uh, I just kept doing it, and that's the way I was doing it, so I just kept pulling them out like 9, 12 months out of where they were, because yeah. they were really strong. So that's why I'm glad that we're working with them now, because like, yeah. yeah. they're like, they're really <laughs> 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 And I can kind of give them some money to say thanks. But, um, but they do, but I knew from just recruiting engineers, if I wanted a junior engineer, they were spot on. Thanks, yeah. Really good. But they come with a lot of life experience. Yeah, <coughs> yeah. That's, that's one of the one of the benefits from that. Yeah. Okay. Um, cool. So thanks everyone. Um, so I'm Chris Casey. I'm the talent acquisition manager for AO.com. Um, so I'm going to admit something right now. Um, I'm a auctionman that lives in Lancashire. Um, and do you know what makes it worse? I'm hardly a auctionman from Hull originally. So. Yeah, a lot. Let's just deal with that right now. Um, so I'm, look, I'm, I'm talking to manager at AO.com. Those of you that, that don't know AO.com, we're an online e-commerce business, so you might have seen the adverts, AO, let's go, and usually get that shouted at a career fair quite regularly. Um, and my family, my, my wife's uncle still thinks I work for AOL. That's not the case. Um, so but the thing that, that really impressed me about AO when I joined was, um, just how, how big the company is. So we're nearly 4,000 strong. We've got a huge recycling plant in Telford. We recycle over 700,000 fridges a year, which is the biggest in the UK, and legally as well, um, which not a, lot of, not a lot of places do. Um, we've got a huge logistics function and a, a mobile um, phone business um, in Thatcham now, and set up in, in Germany. So I've done the whole kind of Improving agency into RPO into internal, and um, so now I manage a team that recruits all back office, but a lot of my backgrounds um, tech the tech industry. Um, so I suppose why candidate experience? Um, it kind of follows on quite nicely off the back of, of Sean's um, talk around the digital skills gap and actually the difficulties that everyone has in finding um, talented people. And actually, it's all good finding them, but. When you bring them into your process, you know that's the real challenge then, because they're not just going to be talking to yourselves; they're going to be talking to other companies as well. And um, sixty percent of candidates go through a bad experience um, in, a, in a recruitment process. I've been through them, um, and do you know what? No one's perfect. And this isn't to say, by the way, that AO deliver a faultless, amazing candidate experience, because there are things that you have to learn from to, to get to to a good level. And of that sixty percent of um, Candidates that have a bad experience, 75% of them usually share that experience. 
with other people. So a lot of you know that if someone has a bad experience, they will share it with 10 people, whereas if they have a good experience, it'll usually only be three people, four people, that kind of thing. So kind of want to talk you through a few um, kind of experiences of my own, things that I've learned, things that I've researched. I read a lot of really boring white papers that I've tried to summarize a little bit and not make them as boring. So one thing that you find at the minute, so if I was to ask you when you first started your career, in, in whatever career you are, where you've been 40 years, would anyone have an idea? Would anyone be able to say, I know where I'll be in 40 years? I'd be really surprised if, and if you did then, you know, career, keep, keep going. Um, but the, a lot of people now, my dad's just passed his 40 years with the same company and I just, it's just not a thing anymore, is it? You don't see people, as, as, and not in, in this day and age, that have been at a company 40 years. And I think a lot of the time now, people aren't looking to join a business. And it's going to be quite controversial. It's join a business for a career. Actually, what I think they're doing is joining to, to add to their portfolio of experience. So you see, let's take developers, for instance. If you've got a developer that's worked with the same company on the same projects for, for 10, 15 years, actually what value are they going to bring to you unless they're like a direct competitor and they're going to take away a lot of the, the insight from that company. So people are looking for portfolio experience and the average um, the average tenure for someone now between the ages of 25 and 36 is 3.2 years which for people that love facts and stats is the pretty much the same amount of time it takes to harvest asparagus from seed. <laughs> yeah? So hence the uh, bit of star in, in, in the corner. So yeah, it takes about just about around three years to harvest asparagus from seed. Now I'm not a farmer and I barely eat asparagus, but it was the first thing that I could find that fit around that age, around that <laughs> around that time frame. Um, and look, say about don't mention the war. So it's a huge buzzword, the war on talent. Um, and I think Sean did a really good job of talking about why it's important to kind of understand the challenges and, and actually where them, them demographics are. Um, and where are we at? Okay, so a lot of people now, you know, we, we do a lot around exit interview data. We, we review why people are leaving, the reasons they're joining other companies. And you'll never leave a company if they're not offering you more money. Very rarely. It's very rare that you leave a company because actually they're paying less, but they've got the ping pong table and the, the culture's great. Um, it's, you, there's always going to be some kind of uplift at some point or more responsibility. So that's not the real reason why people look to leave a company anymore. And, and Sean actually touched on it a lot, so I won't go into too much detail, but self-development, experience, learning off others, that flexibility and that work-life balance, that what else are you, are you going to give to me other than, other than that salary? That, that's a big thing at the minute, and I think that, that that's a really crucial point in which we need to understand when we're taking people through the process. There's a lot of companies that give a really poor process, but right at the end of it, slap a 15 grand, 20 grand price tag, there you go, there's an uplift for you. And you won't keep people, and that's, if you're trying to beat that 3.2 years, if you want your asparagus to grow, um, you need to offer people a lot more than that. So, it starts before you know it, so the kind of experience doesn't start from that telephone call with them or even when they come into the office for an interview actually starts a lot sooner than that so oh yeah hang on so can experience yeah it, it goes before the before the cv so actually the the job advert itself before we even go into bringing people in in that experience let's think about what the job advert looks like the amount of times i see a job advert for and i'm going to use a developer again my background's in tech as well um, Sean's, so I'll usually use that as an example, but the amount of times I see a software developer advert, we're looking for a developer to come in and develop some software. Well, well fucking yes, of course you're going to be looking to bring a software developer in, develop software. What is that software? So I think a big thing first of all is give them a real clear overview of, of what it is they're coming to do. You know, you could be recruiting a software developer to develop James Bond's next exploding pen, right? But if you don't tell them that on the on the job spec, and he's like, come work for, come work for us, you're going to be developing some software and using some really cool skills. 
but don't tell them actually what they're working on, then you're not going to attract their people in the first place. So give them a real clear, concise, to the point job description. A really big thing as well is don't beat around the bush. Um, I, I put a tweet out the other week around um, the amount of companies that don't advertise salary. And I, I understand why they don't at times because it can, it can create politics internally, but actually you're fighting the wrong battle there. So, you know, if you're paying a certain amount and you know it's, it's, it's not market rate, don't hide that fact because you're gonna go all the way through the process and waste everyone's time to then disappoint. So talk about what your package is, what you're gonna be offering, what, what's in it for them. Don't hide anything because it's gonna get found out. You're gonna waste time. It's gonna leave a sour taste in the mouth. Um, so cover the essentials as well, um, whether it's around salary expectations, responsibilities of the experience and skills required. Because um, the last thing that a candidate will want to do is apply for a job. They believe it's perfect and then it's not. And then that's why you get so many people not passing probation, not, not even staying with the company three to six months. Because I don't know how many times have people spoke to people, why are you leaving? Actually, I was told to be working on these projects and all I'm doing is, is maintaining this, this old crummy little system here. It happens all the time. So start with that kind of thing. Sorry, I get really kind of angry and miserable when I talk about anything really fun, which is strange when you talk about kind of experience because I'm hoping I'm not like that in an interview. Um, so the other key thing as well, which, which just talking right from day one when someone's applied, when they apply and you speak to them for that first time, I think it's so important that you, you understand the role that you're recruiting for. And, and look, if, if you are recruiting for a software developer, you don't need to know the ins and outs of what a software developer does and what clean code looks like. But understand what that project is or that product that they're working on and why it's important to the business. And be knowledgeable about it. The more you know about it, that developer or whoever it is you're talking to, that finance professional, they're not going to expect you to know how to do that job. They're just going to expect you to know what that job entails. So a massive kind of thing around that is just to, to kind of know your stuff or know the basics. And people like talking about themselves and people like talking about what they do. So ask them, say, you tell me why, why you, you think you're not good for this job or the hiring manager, you tell me in layman's terms, because I'm not a software developer, why this job is good. Keep focusing on you, I need to stop focusing on you. <laughs> um, so again, um, one of the things that I find as well is, all right, yeah, you might find a job, uh, you, you might have a, a really awesome job description, but where is it? Where are you, where are you advertising it? Where's your careers page? I, I always have this conversation with, with, with AO around, um, AO.com is, is, is our site, but, and then we get so much traffic to it, but our careers page, it's not advertised anywhere on it. We have a separate page. And a lot of companies do that. So how easy is it to find where your careers page is? How easy is it to find where your job adverts are posted? And I'm not saying that you have to spend loads of money on external advertising, but also that content as well. Um, and what, how are you providing what work is like at your company? Um, let's have a look. So when they do finally find the job advert as well, how easy is it to apply? I'm a, I hate application forms and I hate cover letters. Don't agree with them. Um, a real close friend of mine, she's just uh, moving into a new role and they asked her for a detailed cover letter. And, and I question why that is. Why, why should you have a cover letter? Um, and I'm sorry if that's what people ask for, by the way. Um, that's just my opinion. Um, like it should be, it should be in your in your CV. And actually, when you talk about that unconscious bias feel of, of a CV, should all you should really want to know, understand from that kind of from first application is that first three to five years of experience. Doesn't matter what university you went to. Doesn't matter what sex, what age, what gender, how far they've located. The amount of times I've had pushback from hiring managers saying, "Oh, it's it's too much of a commute for them." Who is that for you to say? Like that their commute's too long. They might be buying a house next door for all you know. There's a lot of things that you need to take into account. So the ease of the application is a huge thing. Don't give them so much. We're trying to attract talent. We're not trying to deter them before they've even applied. Um, I often say that you know a lot of people are on LinkedIn. Just use the LinkedIn profile. You'll find out the, de the detailed information that you want when you're talking to them, when you're engaging with them. It doesn't have to be written down. No one reads it. How many people read the first paragraph of someone's thing that says they're, they're good at working in a team and equally on their own? 
Like, I could write that about my one-year-old daughter. Like, it's just, you know, it, like, I think we need to focus on what's, what's really important. And there's a huge thing around testing your journey as well. Um, and I probably should talk about this later on once we've covered a few, few parts of the journey, but we talk about diversity and inclusion and, and actually how inclusive is your journey. So we're going off through a bit of a, a, a journey ourselves in the recruitment team at AO around what our current recruitment process looks like. So we're creating these personas um, of, of different diverse, um, diverse personas, I suppose. So um, whether you're John, who's in a wheelchair, or, or Sarah, who's, who's blind, how, how do you fit in our process and how easy is it for you to apply? How easy is it for you to be taken through the process? that onboarding process as well. So the big thing around anything before you even speak to someone is how, how visible your adverts are, the look and the feel of them, and, and how easy it is for people to apply. Um, nobody wants to trawl through pages and pages of unnecessary applications and questions kind of simply don't have the time. So a massive, massive part, when we look at exit interview, not exit interview data, sorry, we we ask for feedback from every candidate that we interview, um, not from telephone, but anyone that steps foot through the door. And when we first started doing it, the only people we'd get feedback from were the people that were successful. Um, and obviously because they were successful and they wanted to make a good impression, we got loads of really great positive feedback, which is, which is great for, for um, recognising people in the team and, and how they've done with that kind of experience. But we can't learn a lot from that and we can't move forward. So we kind of cut that off and we really focused on people that were unsuccessful. We started sending a lot of um, feedback forms out. That kind of stops that continued model where, you know, what are we doing well, what aren't we doing so well, what should, what should we consider? And um, we, we still got really good feedback, but the, the one common theme was always around communication. I didn't know where I was at in the process or I was waiting for feedback, I didn't know what the next steps would be, um, I'd not heard anything for a couple of weeks, they were kind of running trends and that's kind of what I hear a lot anyway. So when we talk about communication, we, we, we talk about it needs to be early and often, um, once your candidate applies, make communication with them. If you want to get in contact with your, one of your friends, how would you do it usually? Anyone? Text. Text, yeah. A lot of people say text unprofessional. It's not unprofessional, it's convenient. Um, if someone texts me, I'm likely to text them back pretty much straight away. If someone rings me, I, I'll avoid it and I might, I might forget to call them and then bump into them in a couple of days. Ah, you call me, sauce. Um, so look, texting is just a, such a basic, basic, easy thing to do. Um, and actually, this will come up a lot during the candidate's journey as well, is texting because there's so many quick wins you can get from a little text. And I'll, I'm going to jump to it now because I can't wait. Um, <laughs> so a really simple but effective text on, in the pre-boarding stage, just text them to tell them the kit's ready. Just set your laptop up, it looks awesome. Can't wait for you to join. That little nugget of information then just puts that smile on the person's face. And when they get that headhunt message the next day of Sky saying, oh, we've got this, um, we've got this day coming up. You should come and uh, interview with us. Um, they might just think twice because you've sent them a little cheeky text here that they're, um, <laughs> the laptop's ready and you're keeping them engaged and you're talking. One of the really good things that we do, which is really cool, and again I'm jumping to my next slides, but yeah, um, is when we're interviewing candidates, we listen to what they're talking about, we listen to what they're interested in, and when we offer them, we always buy them a book for their first day, and it's either related to something that we've discussed in the interview or something that we uh, that's related to the project that they're going to be working on. So it's just got that real nice personal feel. So when they join on day one, there's that book on horse riding that they were considering taking up, or whatever that hobby or, or that conversation was. And it, it's, it's just a little note that you make, and it costs five, six quid, depending on the book. Um, and but that's the the difference in in that day one experience, and the, just being like anything else. Um, so again, once you kind of going back again because I jump a lot. Um, once you kind of apply, make sure that you have regular contacts. Thank them for the application. That's just an easy thing to do. A lot of this stuff as well can be automated as well, depending on the ATS system that you're using or, or whatever you've got set up. 
um, wherever you work. So thanking them for their applications, a really quick and easy thing. It sounds so obvious, but a lot of people don't. And the amount of people, so one of the companies I used to work at, the amount of phone calls we would get, I don't know if you received my application or um, did you get it, where's it at, where are we up to? And even though they're little two, three minute calls, it takes up a lot of time and you all know you're all in in-house recruitment. How hard is it to find time to recruit? It's, it's our main responsibility, but we don't have time to do it. So automating these little things can really help. So I get with high volume stuff, it's, it's difficult to, to be personable, but and especially with the text messaging stuff, there is software out there, but try and be as personal as, pro as possible, relate back. I, most of my interview notes when I'm interviewing with the, with the hiring manager, is more about the person as opposed to how they are fit because then I can use that as buying and how I'm talking to the candidate and referring back to how's your little lad doing in football or has your dog recovered from tonsillitis? I don't know what the what the subjects might be, but you know, anything that you can do to relate back to them. It's quite an old school agency technique that probably that's probably where I've learned from is every time I speak to a candidate I make all the notes I can so that next time I speak to them I can build that rapport again. And it's the same situation, it's the same thing really. Prep them for the interview, don't surprise them, don't chuck a big fat test in if you've not told them about it. There's nothing worse, no matter how good you are at your job or how confident you are, interviews are a quite stressful situation. Um, and if they aren't prepped for it and you, you surprise them, then you're not going to see their full potential. Um, I would always follow calls up with emails. Um, and yeah, the whole thing about texting them, it's unprofessional, no it's not, it's convenient. So, basically the, that communication piece, you'll, you'll see that's quite a big theme throughout. Um, so if we move very quickly on to, to the interview then. Um, for me, there's, there's no one size fits all approach to an interview and we're having this discussion today about what should our standardised interview process be across the business. and. Big question that so we recruit everything from sales to IT to finance to drivers, gas engineers. I'm not gonna have, I'm not gonna interview a gas engineer the same way I'd interview a data scientist or of someone in finance and you have to be flexible with it. What you can have is is a robust I suppose you can have a robust model, but it has to be flexible. So if you're gonna say, right, we'll telephone interview, we'll face to face. There will be definitely a task, whether that's before, after, in the middle, and then an offer. It, it, it needs to be, there needs to be a real flexible approach on it, and something that's clear to the candidate as well. I'm a massive advocate for not grilling. Um, I'm not, that's not me, I'm not a vegetarian. I know I've already talked about asparagus, and now I'm saying don't grill. Um, do grill, not in an interview. Um, there's plenty of ways to understand someone's experience without sticking a spotlight on them and going at them saying, how do you do this, try this. You're not testing, you are testing them, you're not testing them um, in that respect. Um, a big thing for me is just, we, we're a very, very values driven company so I'm very careful not to say culture led interview because there's that whole debate around the culture fit, culture rad, but actually we're a very values fit business. So. Our core values are, we've got five, so there's fun, bold, driven, caring, and smart. So a lot of our questions are, are, are sort of pitched around um, their values. And when we say one of our values being fun, I'm not expecting someone to come in with balloons and beers and, and uh, kick the football around the office. That Our fun is, is, is almost around, you know, how do you enjoy work? How do you come to work and enjoy being in this environment? So. For a software developer, for instance, it might be collaborating with other people. So actually, they might not want to be in an office where it's just rows and rows and rows of desks. They might want to be in an office that's got standard boards and whiteboard areas and, and sofas and or whatever it might be, ping pong tables, collaborate over a game of table. Um, so yeah, anyway, again, off tangent, don't grill. Um, it still needs to be challenging. Um, I've seen companies make a mistake where they, they, it's even far too relaxed. So candidates will come in, or, and developers have spoken to me about going to companies, and it, it's almost been that relaxed that actually it's put them off the role. They don't feel, like, if the interview's relaxed, is the role going to be challenging? Am I, am I coming into this role? Am I going to be able to develop this pen for James Bond? I don't know if I, if I want to, it doesn't sound very fun, it's a pen. 
But make sure that the, the interview's challenging, make sure it, it, it suits the, the environment that you work in. So our um, tech tasks for developers are very collaborative. There's a lot of pair programming involved, some whiteboard sessions, because that's how we work. Don't do that if that's not the way you work. And I think that's a, another thing around managing expectations. You can try and attract these people and you're so desperate to get these people in that you'll sell them the dream of remote work and flexible hours. And actually when they start, it's flexible. You can have half an hour off lunch, but, but you have to work it back into your day tomorrow and we have to log it as well. And companies do that. It's, everyone should know this, but it's a two-way system. You know, in more, more cases than not, you need them more than they need you. In Manchester, it's six vacancies to one developer at the minute. So, you know, if you're interviewing that person, they've just got three, four other offers that are potentially coming to us. You've really got to give them this, this fluid, but detailed experience. So I suppose, how do, how do we do it? Um, so at AO, if, when you come for a face-to-face -face interview, the first thing we do, which is pretty standard for us, and, to be fair, a lot more com companies are doing it now, is just give them a tour of the place, show them the environment, show them the culture, take them specifically to where they would be based, so finance on the top floor, um, and what I don't want to do is march develop around four floors of, uh, to then finish on finance where they'll probably never be. Um, so I'll take them to the areas of interest and then the, the working space as well. Introduce them to a couple of people on the way, this is Sean, he's a recruitment manager for DJSS. I'm pretending I work for you now. Um, Good job. <laughs> there we go. Um, give them a real feel for it all and, 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 and get them to ask questions about the environment as well. How does this feel? Is it similar to where you're working? That kind of thing. And then the first thing that we do when we sit down for the interview, there's usually myself or, or a recruiter in, the, in most interviews uh, as that kind of values gatekeeper. Um, and then there'll be a uh, the, the manager that's hiring the role and also someone that would be within the team so that they get a feel for, for a little bit more. Um, we'll all introduce ourselves, we'll purposely talk about our personal lives first of all and, and talk about what we do in our spare time, who we do it with, what interests us and excites us and then we'll talk a little bit about the role we do in the business. Um, and we purposely do that to set expectations for what we want to find out about them first. So we always want to find out, tell me a bit about yourself. And if we started with them first and asked them that question, it, it's quite challenging. You find that a lot of people revert straight back to the CV. Well, I went to university and did this degree and then I started working here and then moved here. That's, their, that's everyone's standard go-to. And I think if someone asked me straight off, you know, tell me a bit about yourself, that's the first thing I'd do. Probably did it at the start of this. We'll look back at the recording later. Um, if you want to know a bit about me outside me outside of work, I've got a one year old, so I'm trying to learn the old dad thing, that's my new skill. I practiced this speech in front of Peppa Pig last week. Um, went down really well and no no one mentioned anything, so I've no positive <laughs> or negative feedback from that. Um, so yeah, I think it's a really in, important piece to, to really for them to get to know you and who you are and who they'll be working with. And then you find out a bit about them and they will always pretty much 99% of the time naturally go into their, their experience and, and then that's the conversation started then. Um, we have really kind of values based questions as I said that are uh, based around our, our core values but without making it very obvious so I, if one of our values is smart for instance we don't say tell me how smart you are or what's the smartest thing you've done, it doesn't work that way and um, we have a, a set kind of group of questions that we pick and choose depending on what the role is we're recruiting for and, and what we've agreed with the hiring manager. Um, but usually, and, and all the time, they're very open based questions, they're never closed questions and we, we should all know that anyway, being, being recruiters. The pre-boarding phase, um, I could have just done a full piece just on the pre-boarding phase and it's something that I don't see anyone doing fantastically. Um, some people do it really good. I think we are on a journey at the minute, so I'm not saying that we do it perfectly either, but pre-boarding, so many people think the job is done when the candidate's offered, and, and I mentioned it earlier on, and it, it couldn't be any further from the truth. That is like the no man's land situation you've got there, because you've got someone you've just offered, 
he'd literally just thrown them out there into the market to kind of say, look at this guy, he's open. So when you've offered him, that's when the other count and the headhunts come in, Sky are knocking on the door, BJSS, or oh, what are you doing? Oh, actually, I've just been through that process, I might as well see what's going on. It's a really dangerous time, it's really high exposure to counter offers and competing vacancies. So this is why this, this four week, it might be four weeks, it might be three months, it might be six months, it's such a vital stage where the communication's gotta be so on point. Um, and this is where it comes down to that kind of staggered comms piece. There's a lot of companies as well out there that just shove all the information into this massive pack and say, this is all your stuff you'll need to know. These are all our policies. Who's, everyone's obviously got a job in this room. Who's ever, before they started that job, read through the policies? And if you have, like, fair play. <laughs> but it's not the first thing, like, come on, send me your policies. Let me find out what the smoking regulations are and what I need to do if I've cut my finger. Get them all over. Let me find out what's going on on my first day. You don't care, do you? What you want to know is, Who's my team? What are they working on? How am I gonna? How do I need to dress? It's such a basic thing, but how am I gonna dress? I know you've got a canteen. Do I need cash? Or do I need to bring my own food? What's going on there? Give them some real tangible stuff, but stagger it. Send that text when the laptop's set up. Send them a text when um, a project has been released. Keep them updated and, and and try and get that balance between you doing it, your hiring manager doing it, and and even get some of the team involved. How great would it be if, if one of the guys on the team you've never met, you didn't even know where, dropped you a, a line or a text and said, providing GDPR compliant, um, <laughs> sent you a text saying, hey, it's John from the team, we haven't met yet, really looking forward to you going. Just so you know, you're going to be sat next to me. Uh, what do you drink? Um, non alcoholic wise, um, because I'll have it ready for you tomorrow. Imagine having that. Yeah, I'd be buzzing, I'd be like, I can't wait to meet John when I start, because he sounds awesome. So stagger the kind of comms and, and just little tiny things that probably aren't relevant and really relevant. Um, the really relevant stuff that we should be sending them, leave that to HR, let them do it and they can take that glory. I don't, I'm don't. i not bothered about policies and contracts. Should be worried about contracts, that's a very important thing, but I'm not <laughs> getting through the door. Um, so yeah, don't bore them, send them the relevant exciting stuff. I'm a massive fan of swag. And I'm one of them that will just glitch someone up and march them through the street and be like, hey, oh, honeys. And I nearly brought a load today, just put it on halfway through just to add a bit of element to it. But um, harvest, harvest your swag like you would your, um, they said avocado then, asparagus. Um, so we're really fortunate to have, um, to work closely with our employer brand and, um, we, we tend to have hoodies that we give out to a lot of our devs, um, so they get that along with the books that they receive that's either relevant to the interview or the project that they're working on. Um, even just little things like pens and stuff. If you don't want to send them out, set them up on a desk, even if it's just a notepad and pen. It doesn't even need to be branded, just give them a nice little area to, to come into on, on day one. Um, a big thing that, so when I first joined AO, they asked me for a bit of a bio on myself that I could share with the team and why I wanted to join AO, a bit of a background about myself, some hobbies and interests and a, and a funny story. Um, and I thought that was great, I thought that everyone wanted to find out about that. And, and after a few months of being there, we used to get these, these um, profiles sent through and, and it was really interesting because you had something to kind of relate to with, the, with them when they started, but they never had anything about us. So one of the things that we're working on at the minute is actually, let's do the same thing. Let's still request that employee, uh, employee profile, but let's send them a team profile out with the same questions on, funny stories about us and why we're, where we've joined AO and that kind of thing. Um, there's some really good software out there as well that can help with pre-boarding. We aren't using any software at the minute, but we're, we're going through um, investigating this kind of thing. And actually, myself and Sean went um, to a conference in Amsterdam that, that covered pre-boarding and onboarding. Um, so pre-boarding being from offer and onboarding being till three, six months down the line, even after probation. Um, I suppose you can't put a timeline on on onboarding someone into to the way you guys work and the way your culture is or whatever that is. Um, Apical is one that might be worth looking at. They do some really cool stuff around gamification as well. So you can, you can do, play some games that interact with some of the team and you can see employee profiles and 
Um, there's a company I spoke to when I was doing this research, and it's going to kill me now who they are. But they have um, so they have Slack channels where, and one of them's coffee with a stranger, um, and you, you, they encourage every new start to go onto the, the Slack channel that's a coffee with a stranger, and and put right, I'm available at half ten on, on Tuesday, and anyone, someone random will pick it up. And one of the rules is that they, every director in the business has to do one a week. So you've got someone at some point in the business will have a coffee with a stranger, that'll be one of the directors. And it's just good at getting to know people and making you feel that like you fit it in. My first day at AO, a guy called Matt Hayhoe, he's a, he's a BA for us. Um, I should have said that, he's a BA specialist. <laughs> <laughs> we record it so long now, you've got all his details. Um, he, um, I didn't know who he was, and, and we all wear a specific lanyard or colour when, when we join, it's orange. So you know that we're a new employee, um, and we wear that for a week, so that and we encourage all our other AOs to, to make sure we're really engaging with new starters, find out how they're getting on, do they know where they're going, do they know that on every floor the men's and the female toilets on opposite directions? Because I've been with the business three years, and this week I um, <laughs> I went to the wrong toilet and didn't realise till I washed my hands and walked out. Um, so things like that, and, and he, he we've got an on-site Starbucks and. Um, he just grabbed me and said, oh, you knew, who are you? Come on, let's have a coffee. And he, and he literally uses it as blunt and, and, and in your face like that. So I was like, oh, well, I better do this first day on the job. I had a coffee with him and do you know what? What a day just to be introduced to someone like that and someone to just go out of the way to, to sit you down and find out about yourself. And it, it, it felt like I was really kind of wanted at the, at the business and it's just so easy to do. So the pre-boarding stage is, and I can't stress how important that, that piece of, of, of time is, and it's always great if you can to get them in for a coffee again during that time, or meet some more of the team, or if the team are doing a stand-up, see if they can make it. It's not always the case because they'll either be working a notice, or if they're not, they might not have time off to spend doing hobbies, going caving, or um, whatever it might be. But um, it's a massive piece. Everyone focused on the onboarding, and the interview process, but there's a piece in, in between this that's just as crucial. So we'll talk about the impact and some of the, um, or the impact of a bad experience, should I say, and some of the um, stats that I found, there was a white paper that did 7,000 um, people that went through a, a recruitment journey. Um, and positive, then what they found is that positive candidate experience is linked to a greater advocacy. And, I mean, that, it just says it there from my experience with, with Matt Hayhoe around that first day and, and how warm it felt and how encouraging it was to be there. Um, the experience someone has is associated with their willing, willingness to recommend the organisation as well. So these guys might not have even been successful, but if they've had a really good experience and they're really bought in and they've felt welcomed, they're going to tell other people and say, do you know what, I need to be that company, I still want to work there, it was great. Fortunately, didn't get the job. As long as you can back that up with good, solid, tangible feedback that they can take away and, and learn from for their next interview, and you'll see it in one of the stats later on, that, that, that it's very likely that they'll, they'll apply again. Um, when candidates are satisfied with their experiences, they're more, like, more than twice as likely to recommend um, the organisation. So basically, the, the willingness to recommend appears to be influenced by all aspects the hiring process for being well kept informed through to ease and speed of completing the application and the interview and that goes back to what we're talking about with the job advert and being able to apply we did once trial um and apply now uh, uh what did we call it it's like a, a fast track app application where basically all they had to give was their name first name second name and contact details and nothing else that's great for like really niche, hard to fill roles. But when you are recruiting um, contact centre agents where you get 300, 400 um, applications anywhere, it says it's a chaos, so be careful. But what we didn't, we didn't, we made the mistake of not turning it on for certain ones, we just turned it on for it all. So my, my the guys at the software there was like, oh, actually, we've got someone there, it's worth a look because it's one person. But then the, the, the guys that are looking after the customer services, I'm pretty sure one of their laptops exploded. Um, so it's just some interesting information there around actually, um, you know, how satisfied they were, keeping well informed, the job information being easily available. What was the recruiter talking about? Did that marry up? Did the hiring manager marry up with that as well? 
Um, the application process being easy to complete and the process being quick. There's nothing worse than interviewing and waiting a week to get feedback. Um, if you can get feedback, give them a chance to get home if you already know they're a no. But um, there's, there's that kind of 12 to 24 hours, 48 hours, anything after that, then we need, you need to be kind of hurrying up. And I, and I get sometimes that that's out of your control and it's the hiring managers, but I think there's sometimes an education piece around that. So this research as well, it, it reveals that can experience is not just affecting the hiring process, it can, it can impact um, potential sales as well. So the desire among candidates to be a customer of the organisation is higher among those that had a good experience as opposed to them that, that didn't. And, I, and I, I think I can kind of resonate to that with experiences that I've had in the past where actually you do take it personally if you've had a bad experience or someone doesn't get back to you. We're all in recruitment, so if you've applied for a role, do you expect a response? And if you don't get a response, I, I take it personally. I'm not going to work with them. Um, but yeah, so it's it's higher for those who've had a good experience at 54% compared to those with a poor experience at 25%. And can experience not only relates to job acceptance rates and advocacy, but as I said, it, it can affect sales. And given candidates talk, this effect will likely kind of be amplified. Um, I mean, the, 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 you take developers, for instance, the community that they have, everyone knows each other. Um, so if you piss one off, you're going to piss a lot off. Um, while many candidates are happy with the speed and ease of the hiring process, more than one in five candidates said that they were not well informed. And that goes back to some of the stuff that we found as well from our own feedback and, and the um, feedback service that we were sending out to our candidates. Like the key thing was about keeping them well informed in that communication piece. Um, there's clearly an opportunity to improve the experience, and particularly by offering multiple channels of communication as well. If you have text them, they're likely to text you back rather than call you. Call does take up a lot more time, especially when you, you, you're on um, high volume roles or you've got time deadlines. And every group I've ever spoken to is just never not busy. Um, so texting them will automatically get them into the mentality of texting you back. Emails work depending on how you're sat and how you look at your emails. If you look at your emails on your phone while you're at about, if you're sat at a desk all day, emails can be very distracting. Um, and I suppose it, it depends on your relationship with candidates as well. So you've got to kind of um, keep it that way. I'm going to stop throwing stats out because I'm going to have someone's eye out because um, I know that it's been kind of stat, stat overload this last little bit but hopefully it just kind of backs up some of the stuff I've been waffling about for the last kind of 20 minutes or so. Um, so I'm going to go on to some tips now, some asparagus tips. <laughs> Um, so the, I, the key things that I've kind of taken from a lot of the, the journey that I've been on are candidates who like the brand or reputation are more likely to apply, even if they're not successful, they're likely to reapply um, or at least refer others. So with this organisation, they should start with a, a strong employer brand. And if you do not have an employer brand manager, that doesn't mean you don't have employer brand. Your, brand, your employer brand is your, your workforce. Um, if one of the biggest wins that you can get is that real, um, oh, what's the word? I've gone dead now. Um, so when you're getting your, your developers to do all the talking themselves and to promote stuff, that real authentic kind of um, content that they're bringing out, rather than you giving them a script and saying, just post that for us, and it's not their word and it's not their language, they're, they're, they're your biggest advocates. Again, get them out there, get them doing talks, get them out in the community at meetups, on LinkedIn, or wherever that kind of talent pool is of people. And um, that's your, your employer brand before, you, if, if you're not lucky enough to have someone with specific role is employer branding. Um, you know, we want to, they want to be kept informed during the process. You may not um, want to consider using multiple channels of communication to connect um, with the candidates and keeping them informed. So whether that is texting, phoning, email, tweeting them, Whatever, whatever works, um, make sure that it's just consistent enough. Again, um, deliver an experience, so don't grill them. Make sure it's challenging, but you know, you're know, you gonna get the best out of them if they feel comfortable. You're not gonna get the best out of them if they're, ne if they're already more nervous than they should be, and you're peppering them with, with solid questions. And then whether successful or not, candidates talk, like I said, so what they say may affect the reputation of the company, 
and it can even influence the likelihood of them being a customer. Um, candidate experience is wide reaching and it should, and it, as such, organisations should strive to create the best possible experience for every candidate. Thanks, I talked very quick, sorry. <laughs> uh, any questions on that? Anyone had a really good candidate experience? Preferably not the company they're at now. <laughs> I think you've had a really good candidate experience. I think the pre-boarding is really important. Um, I think I, I think we forget about it. Um, I think you know, especially grad schemes where you might be making offers very early on in the year. You might not start them until September. You've got a massive gap there, and if you're not doing stuff in between that and, and don't have a strategy around that, you're going to fail, and you're just going to miss out on people. So you know, even when you're you know like. Uh, recruiting the team. If you're doing a team night like out, why don't you start along? Bring yeah. a bowling or something like that. Or you know, if you're hiring a manager, you know, take you down a pub or something, or, or say, hey, I'd love to you know, take you out for a drink. What do you drink? Find yeah. out a bit more about them. And do you know what? Even if they even if they don't make it, it's the fact that you've asked them and you've yeah. invited them. It just really yes. keeps that spark going. The graduate ones. You know what? We don't recruit a lot of grads, mm. so I don't always consider it from that aspect, but. I bet the amount of applications that they put in and the amount of conversations they're having and people are grads throughout, if you're offering someone and then they don't finish their course until three, four months down the line, it's a lot of time you've got to keep them engaged. So you're right, um, it can be a lot more difficult with high volume stuff, but it's not it's not an excuse. There are tools and there's technology out there and a text or send the same text out, even if it's if it's not that possible, at least you're getting some communication over to them. It's like placement students, isn't it? Yeah. Bring them in for a year in the industry and you send them back, you've offered them and accept them, you just leave them until that month before and you're like, oh, can you start on uh, Monday the 12th of September, please? And it's like, give them those project updates or people, the project they worked on, you know, can you do something where you can, those people, if they've moved project, can update and just give them those insights of what it's like? Yeah, if they're a full time student, you know, they're only studying three days a week, so they've got plenty of time to do projects in the other time as well. I love that idea you, t- you, you spoke about earlier that your company yeah. is around having someone as a graduate that's still still studying but working at the same time. Yeah. I think that's brilliant. You get so much out. We found that we had a grad scheme and then we would recruit interns. And we actually found that uh, the interns that we recruited in, and they might be on Facebook years or whatever, um, they actually outperformed all the graduate, graduate schemes and this. Uh, they stayed longer. Uh, it, it was a no-brainer, and we actually put it away from grand schemes because the grand schemes you put them on a plinth, and you know, you know you give them everything, and they actually turn out like, turn into little brats. Um, <laughs> like even um, what's it, Dyson? Um, uh, Dyson employ somebody just to look after their grand scheme candidates as a bit of a nanny because right. they are a bit like that. Um, but you, you find if you get, you know, be flexible, you know, with your, you know, you know give trust, you know, be flexible, you're probably going to get a lot more out of people to treat people like that. Yeah. We've um, done uh, round the grass of some of the, because <coughs> we've always brought in grass, there's mm-hmm. always a thing of like, you know, could you need to, you know, yeah. all that stuff. We've changed it this year, so we were like a four week academy now. So everyone goes through that anyway, so yeah. we bring them all up to about the same yeah. level. Well, anyone who's got gaps. Um, we're actually running a march and take this year, so people that decide not to go straight to work when they complete you yeah. go travelling, take time out, something that's happened at home, whatever, and don't. They struggle to get onto a grad scheme the next year, so then left the bottom of everyone who's graduated that year. Yeah. So we've just found nice, brilliant. So loads of people are starting yeah. March, or you know, yeah. that kind of thing. And we're like, this is an untapped for us, and we'll just do a double yeah. intake. So we're, we're trialling this year a, a smaller intake, and then we've looked at tech up. Maybe your approach is like a career change thing, looking at bringing a couple of BAs in that way as well. Um, so it, it, we start to just go down, you know, you can't do loads. Right? We always did a comp science degree, we scrapped that. We've got no idea on finance or marketing. As long as you've done some coding at home and got an interest in it, so first part of the process, we do look at uh, having an all right level of coding ability. Yeah. <clears throat> We've opened up that and trying to move away from that traditional view of it has to be that degree to. You're probably going to get 90% from that degree, but you get 10% from this as well. That's awesome. Because uh, people commit, that's why I never did you. I can decide what to commit to. But, you know, people who do have a career, uh, clear view of where they want to go, it's great. I, I'm you know, very uh, opportunistic and kind of just like, I'm like a magpie, it's a shine, like, oh yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. I can't tie down for four years at the union for a year, so I don't want it. It's because I've probably changed my mind three months ago. I'm not like 20 grand debt. Um, so it's good that people like that go, I don't want to do finance anymore. I'll finish my degree, but I want to do development. Come on, we'll, we'll, we'll look at it. So it kind of changes it a little bit. Sorry. Cool. <laughs> um, yeah, cheers. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.